Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. As a colorblind painter, I don't have the benefit of knowing that a color feels right. I can't trust my eyes, especially uh, for the reds and greens. So I've had to develop a non-intuitive approach to color. In this video, by painting with my non-intuitive approach, I'm going to show you how you can improve your color game in your own art. Let's see how it works. I'm priming a wood panel with black gesso from Golden. Gesso acts as a barrier between the wood and the oil paint, so the wood doesn't soak up all of the paint. And it also smooths out the bumps in the wood or canvas. After the gesso is dried, I'm ready to draw my image. I use a one inch grid to get the proportions of my painting exactly the same as my reference image. In this case, I'm using a Prismacolor Premier 10% gray pencil for my grid. Now that I have my image drawn out, I can start painting. I'm mixing up a gradient for the background using only two colors. On the light side, I have yellow ochre deep. It's a fast drying paint, which is good in this case. Also, it's semi-transparent. So some of the background color from that black gesso is going to darken the final result of the yellow. The other color I'm choosing is, is a black. Now it's Mars black. It's not the blackest black, but it is really opaque. And uh, since Mars black is made from a synthetic iron oxide, it'll give a very earthy dark brown when I mix it with the yellow ochre deep. That makes it perfect. Uh, because it'll be relatively inconspicuous compared to the saturated and vibrant colors of the flowers that I'll be painting later on. Once the background has dried completely, I can move on to the flowers. So I start with a rose. Titanium white is an opaque paint that is essential for getting the most out of your colors. It's the paint that you use for tinting. Tinting, by the way, is art speak for adding white. So this is the white you add. I'm creating a gradient from cadmium yellow deep, it's a warm kind of almost orangey yellow, to quinacridone rose, which is a pink. Depending how much of each of these two colors I add, I can get many oranges and pinks from this mixture. And when I add white, I can get even more. For this next flower, I don't want it to stand out too much, so I'm going to mix together a really simple monochrome palette. Now, you can always glaze more colors on top afterwards, but it's a really good spot to start. So the color I'm going to be choosing for this monochrome palette is called Indigo. It's by Michael Harding Oil Paints. It's transparent and it's inky, and it has excellent tinting power. Okay, we're moving to the tulip now, and in contrast to the monochrome palette of the last two flowers, the tulip's going to be really colorful so it stands out. So I have five colors selected for this tulip, and from lightest to darkest, they are, so there's a yellow, it's cadmium yellow lemon, that's a green leaning yellow, or a cool yellow, as you could call it. I'm going to use that for the highlight. And then I have three greens. The lighter green is called bright green lake, and then the mid green is chromium oxide, and the darker green is cadmium green deep. And for the darkest tones, I'm going with ultramarine blue. Using yellow, green, and blue this way is called using an analogous color palette. And what that means is that all of the colors are very close together on the color wheel. There, there's an advantage to this, especially as a colorblind painter. Uh, using an analogous color palette is really safe for me because I don't have to worry about the colors accidentally mixing to create a muddy color. I can mix any of them and I'm just going to come out with a green. I'm moving to the second rose now. I'm going to be doing another monochrome palette for this second rose. I'll be glazing some orange on it later on, but for now I'll just go with the monochrome. It's alizarin crimson, and that color really makes beautiful pinks when white is added to it. It's really slow to dry, so you have to be a little bit patient with alizarin crimson. Like we saw with the indigo, alizarin crimson has a high tinting power. You can get a full range of tones just by adding white. I'm moving to the pair of flowers on the bottom now. I'm really excited about this color. This is one of my newer colors that I've added to my collection. And I haven't played with it a lot, but uh, hopefully here I'll get to see what I can do. This is Old Holland Blue Violet. And I know it's really similar to one of my favorite colors, Dioxazine Purple. This, this uh, blue violet is opaque and it has really, really good tinting power. That's sort of a theme. 
that's uh, starting to develop here. Okay, moving to the pistol. I'm going with an extremely vibrant cadmium orange as the base and yellow lake for the details or the bumps. I'm not exactly sure what they're called. The orange beside the blue violet, it will jump off the canvas and the two colors are near complements. When I say complements, I mean complementary colors. And that means two colors that are on opposite sides of each other on the color wheel. These are colors that are really great for contrasting each other. Okay, on the topic of complementary colors, there are a few small flowers around the big blue violet flowers, and I'll be painting those ones permanent orange. The overall effect of these small flowers will be to balance the large blue violet flowers on each side through a technique called complementary tension. That's the tension created by using complementary colors one against the other. It's a really nice way to balance your painting through a sort of tension. Moving now to the turtle, uh, I'm choosing all the same colors as I did for the tulip, and the, the yellow and the three greens and the blue, and I'll be using them in different amounts and mixtures, and I'll be focusing more on the darker values for the shell and the lighter values for the, for the, for the head. One thing that's really important when working with oil paints is to consider that different colors have different drying times. Knowing what the relative drying times are for each color will allow you to plan your layering and your blending and your glazing accordingly. Sometimes you want to work into, into a wet paint and sometimes you really need that paint to be dry. So that's something to pay attention to. Onto the glass vase now. I've gone with alizarin crimson uh, for a number of reasons. One is that I've used it already in a couple of different areas of the painting and it'll be a nice tie-in. And also it's dark enough to recede into the background and also different enough from the surrounding colors, the greens and the blues, not to confuse them. For the table, I'm going with colors that I sort of think about as non-colors. Um, these are colors that will not draw your attention and they won't compete with the, with the bright, vibrant colors at all. And um, something that will be highly inconspicuous. So the colors I've selected are lemon yellow for the highlights and raw sienna and black. And now there's very little color in these colors, especially to my eyes, and that makes them perfect. They do their job and allow the vibrant colors to stand out. And thank you so much again for hitting that like button and subscribing. Until the next one, you can see what I'm up to on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's Mark Liam Smith. Happy painting.